Welcome to Community Coast, where we are walking through the chronology of the life of Jesus. And you can see I'm smiling. Uh, my voice may be cracking a little bit. We're in the middle of camp at Coast. I've got my T-shirt on um, just to remind you to pray. We need prayer. It's Wednesday, and uh, we've got two more days left at Campa Coast. And we just ask, would you just pray that the Lord opens up the door of salvation for our kids that are here? Our volunteers are rocking it, um, and it's just been exciting to see uh, the energy that's going on with all of these kids here at Campa Coast. So would you just continue to pray for us? Let my t-shirt be a reminder. Um, and if you want to come, stop in on Friday at the uh, uh, closing event. We'd love to see you here on Friday afternoon. At, Camp at, Co at Community at Coast, and that's going to happen throughout this study, my brain is Camp at Coast, um, we have an opportunity to go through the chronology of the life of Christ. And we believe in glorifying God together through life, learning the word, investing into relationships, following the way of Christ, and then E, in life, engaging our world. And so today, we're going to be studying in Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, as we continue a chronological uh, study on the life of Christ. So once again, that's going to be Luke chapter 13. You're probably going to want to also be in 2 Corinthians 10, as well as maybe Matthew chapter 7. So we're going to pick it up, Luke chapter 13, but before we do, why don't we pray? Lord, I'm just so thankful for your word, and I'm so grateful that you spoke and it was recorded, and we have it in order to know the way. So as we just walk through this experience of studying your word, would you open up our minds? Would you open up our eyes? Would you let us see and hear things that maybe we've not understood or seen before and help us to apply it to our lives? In Jesus' name, amen. Let me catch up to speed with where we're at. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's ministering to Jews in Jewish villages and cities and towns as he's on his way. Now, earlier in Luke's gospel, Luke lets us know in Luke chapter 9 that he has set his face as a flint for, towards Jerusalem. Nothing is going to deter him. Nothing is going to stop him. He knows that his time to glorify God with his death, burial, and resurrection on the from the cross to the grave to the ascension is right around the corner. And so he is on his way to Jerusalem. Nothing's going to deter him. He set his face steadfastly. That's what the Bible says in Luke 9, 51, towards Jerusalem. Uh, in fact, even in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, he said that uh, a fire has been kindled, and I, I wish and I long to, to light this fire. And the fire is going to be the, the Holy Spirit falling down on the church to seek and to save the lost. Remember, Jesus' ministry stayed within the confines of Israel. When he died and was, uh, rose again, he commissioned the church to go into all the world. Remember when Jesus said, you'll be able to do more than me. Oh, not more in regards to capacity, capacity but physicality. In other words, Jesus, in his uh, God-man nature stayed in Israel. But to the church, he said, I want you to go out. That is the fire that's being lit. So he's on his way to Jerusalem. He is, uh, excuse me one second, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He is going to be ministering uh, there in Jerusalem. And let's see what happens as we pick it up in Luke's gospel, chapter 13, verse 22. Luke chapter 13, verse 22. And when he went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem, then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? Interesting question. Um, they're traveling with Jesus, and maybe there's not the response of revival that they were hoping for. There are some Jews who believed, and we know that he fed the 5,000, and he also fed the 4,000. Uh, we know that there were thousands of people that followed, but we also know in John chapter 6 that many people turned away, and when Jesus started getting deep into a theological discussion of eat my flesh and drink my blood. <coughs> now, 
the words that Jesus was saying, they were spiritual words. And he was basically saying to hunger and thirst after him the way you hunger and thirst for bread and for water. A great illustration as I needed a, a little sip of water. And here, one of the guys that he's with, or one of the gals, we don't know, basically asks a question and says, are there only a few that are going to be saved? Are there few that are going to be saved? We don't see the response, Jesus, that we thought there would be. And so now we want to know, are there people that are uh, not going to be saved? Who is going to be saved? And I want you to see Jesus' answer. He said to them, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Now we have to stop there for a minute. Because Jesus speaks individually to this person, and he's speaking in context to a Jewish city, village, or town, and he's in the Israeli nation. So we've got to keep all of those things in, uh, in our course of understanding so that we can really grasp what's going on in this test. He says, strive to enter. Listen, you have a responsibility to be saved. That's what he's communicating. You strive to enter. You do everything it takes for you to get saved. Now, fortunately, God did all of the hard work for us, and all we need to do is believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. And according to Romans chapter 10, we will be saved. But the Jewish nation, they had a different theology. You see, they believed because they were descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob just for the fact of their descent, and they were part of the 12 tribes of Israel, which were the 12 sons of Jacob, that they were saved, that they were going to heaven. But Jesus arrives on the scene, and he begins to knock away at the Jewish religion. He begins to let them know that he's the fulfillment of the law. And like Paul tells us, the law was only there to point to the fact we needed a savior. There was no way that any one of us could live a perfect life. And so because of that, Jesus came and lived that perfect life. And then he died our death. We deserve death. We deserved hell. We deserve to be separated from God. But Jesus, he died on the cross and he paid the price of our sin. But he rose again. And because he conquered death, he is alone, alone, able to give eternal life. In fact, he tells us in Revelation that he holds the keys to death in Hades. In other words, he is in absolute control. So he says to the fella, look, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able to. Now, uh, we have to understand, a lot of people would say um, that there is uh, uh, those that God will send to hell by simply saying that they will not be able to. Now, remember, Jesus is in a Jewish context, speaking in a Jewish city, town, and village, and he's speaking to the Jewish nation, and we're going to see that in just a little bit further. Remember, I said that the Jews believed that they were saved simply because they were descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They believed that they were saved because they followed the Jewish law, the Jewish tradition, and the Jewish customs. And so Jesus is making it very clear, you think that is what's going to save you, but that's not what's going to save you. He's communicating to them how they can be saved. It goes all the way back to the beginning of his ministry. He's not changed his tune when he spoke to Nicodemus and said, you must be born again. You've got to be born of the Spirit. And the way that you're born of the Spirit is that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that you confess him with your mouth and you believe in his heart. Remember what I said, God's done all the hard work. Now we get saved. And I want you to receive this again, the word strive to enter through the narrow gate. Strive. This Greek word is where we get our word agonize. It, it means to fight or to compete. It means that when we're saved, there is an evidence of our salvation that's just very clear to everyone who sees that we're saved. And we're going to see many will say, hey, didn't I uh, watch you do this and do this? And wasn't I a part of this? 
and, and what Jesus is going to communicate here. But the truth and the evidence is, is that we've got to strive to enter in. John, we studied this week, this past Sunday, he gives two qualifiers for someone who's born again. That they practice righteousness, so whatever God says, they purpose to do, and that they love people. It's amazing how it's just boiled down to two things. That we want to know the Lord and follow him, practicing righteousness, and that we truly love people. Earlier, in Matthew chapter 7, I'll read it for you, you can write it in your notes. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. This is a matter of fact. There are many people that are going to be separated from God for eternity, and the gate is narrow. There are going to be few that get saved. It's not that God has condemned some people to hell and he uh, 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 chooses for men to go to hell. No, all of us deserved hell. All of us deserved to be separated from God. No, it's an opportunity for us to recognize that God has provided a way of salvation. And he says in verse four, uh, 14 of Matthew 7, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. You see, when Jesus in Luke chapter 13 says, strive to enter, in Matthew chapter 7, when he says, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way, there are few that find, we've got to understand the parable that Jesus gave earlier in Matthew chapter 13. You see, when the word of God goes out into your heart, we have an enemy. And like the birds of the air who either come down and pluck out that seed or the cares of the world that choke, there's a striving in faith, oh, not to say that we're working for our salvation. We're saved. But when we are saved, we're doing everything we can to honor God in our salvation. There's a striving to win the race that is set before us. There's a, a desire to fight the good fight. That's what Paul said. It's 1 Timothy chapter 6. He tells Timothy, fight the good fight. Well, the evidence is a striving, an agonizing, a, a, a fight, a competition that we're in because we have an enemy. So we've got to put everything we've got into faith. Faith is not like osmosis. We just sit around in church and people of greater faith just kind of ooze into us. No, no, no. That's not what happens. We've got a purpose to happen to faith. We've got a purpose to live by faith. We've got a purpose to take steps of faith, to walk by faith. You see, the action is on us to continue the strive. Now, in this fight, the beauty is, Paul lets us know, and I'm going to read it for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the weapons that we have, well, they're not physical weapons. Our striving is in our spirit. It's 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing which ex that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Listen to what Paul says to the Corinthian church. Now, this church is struggling, okay? And he's having to correct them on a myriad of issues. I'm thankful for the first and second letter that he sent. And we know that there was a second and fourth letter that he sent. We just don't have it. But I'm thankful for this, these letters that were given. And I believe I said the, the, it's the first and the third letter that we have. We just don't have the second and the fourth. But the understanding is Paul is making sure, listen, we're in a fight. But the weapons that we use are spiritual, and they're mighty. And the struggles that you have as you're striving in the faith, they will pull down those strongholds. The weapons of prayer, the shield of faith, the very uh, uh, armor of God that Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter 6 is what he's making reference here too. So if you're in your struggle, let me tell you something, family. Keep striving. Keep striving. Because you can be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you is going to perfect it. Now, if we go back into Luke chapter 13, he tells this guy, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not find it. In other words, Jewish nation, 
You think you're going to be saved because you're descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You think you're going to be saved because you try to follow the law or you give your sacrifices or you go to Jerusalem three times a year for the festivals, festivals required of you. But listen to what he says in verse 25. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you began to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, and he'll answer and say to you, I don't know you. Where are you from? This is an eye-opener. You see, he's speaking in the context of a feast because heaven is going to be a great feast. And as soon as Jesus says this, the Jewish people that are listening, a story would pop in their minds. A door shut? Oh yeah, you know the story. His name was Noah. He built an ark for 120 years. He was there amongst them. He was telling them, come into the ark. They didn't believe. They chose to live by sight, not by faith. The Bible says that they were eat, eating and drinking and carrying on. The violence had increased. They were marrying and giving each other, uh, uh, to, to each other in marriage. They were just doing normal life, and it was a very wicked, evil life. And so God, he, well, gives a gospel message through Noah. Come into the ark. Well, after 120 years of God's patience, the rain came. And God shut the door. And those inside were saved, but those outside, well, they perished. They perished after 40 days of rain, 40 days of water coming up from the earth and water pouring down on the earth. And they were banging on the door, let us in, let us in. But God had shut the door, and the time was too late. Now, if you're a believer, something should happen to you. Because there's going to be an end. There's going to be a time when salvation is not offered. Now, for us today, until Christ returns, it's the point when we take our last breath. God gives us a lifetime of him reaching out, seeking and saving the lost through you, his church, through his spirit. And he's trying to purpose to reach the lost. But if, if someone doesn't receive Christ before their last breath, well, the hope for them is not to be with God, but to be separated from God for an eternity where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But he's also saying there's going to be an end. And he's speaking specifically to the Jewish nation. There's going to be a time when Jesus will return the second time and there will be an opportunity to either believe him and receive him or to reject him. That day is going to come. Jesus is going to return. And so, another story that the Jewish person would begin to think of is about Jonah. Oh, shutting the door would remind them of Noah, but an end time... Well, you remember the story. But Jonah was reluctant. God had asked him to go and preach to the most wicked nation in the world, the wicked, most wicked empire in the world at the time, in Nineveh, the Assyrians. Jonah didn't want to go, and you know the story. He went on a boat going the opposite direction until a storm came, and they threw him overboard where a fish swallowed him and took him straight to a shore where he had no place to go but on his way to Nineveh. And there he preached by force. Don't be a Jonah. You see, knowing that there is an end, there should be a passion in us because the Spirit is in us. And the same, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when he told the disciples that he came to seek and to save the lost, he's still about seeking and saving the lost. And his Spirit is in you. And so we passionately should be doing the same thing. But if you're our believer... It's important to recognize there is an end. There is going to be a shutting of the door one day. And maybe it will be for you when you take your last breath. Or maybe it will be for the rapture of the church. But there's a way that we should be living expecting that return. I'm going to read it for you. It's in the book of Romans. Romans uh, chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. I'm going to start reading in verse 11. And do this. Romans 13, 11. Knowing the time that now is a high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. In other words, we're getting closer and closer to the moment. 
the night's far spent, the day's in hand. In other words, you got to get to work. Therefore, cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. In other words, get rid of the things that aren't like Jesus and purpose to be like him. Walk properly as in the day, not in reverently and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. And he gives this direction. Listen, believer, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. The question becomes, knowing that the one day the door will be shut, believer, are you living in light of his return? At the end of uh, the book of Revelation, the Bible says in Revelation 22, the spirit and the bride say, come, come, Jesus, come. Are you living that way? Are you living your life today for him to come? Are you living your life today that you, the church, the Bible says the spirit and the bride say, come, the spirit and the church say, come. Are you living your life right now, this moment, come Jesus, come? Think about your marriage. Think about your relationship with your kids. Or think of what people think of you at work. Is today a day that you could say, come Jesus, come unashamedly? You see, Paul in 2 Timothy, he let us know something. He said, those who long for the appearing of Jesus, those who live in the come Jesus, come, there's a crown waiting for us. A crown for those who are longing for his coming because there's a reward for those who live in expectation of that shut door. There's a reward for those who live in expectation of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, going back to Luke chapter 13, let's see what happens in verse 26. Then you will begin to say, and no, so when he's speaking the you there, now we know that he's talking to someone who doesn't believe, then you'll begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, you taught in our streets. But he'll say, I tell you, I don't know you. Where are you from? Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. Stop there if you would for just a minute. Jesus is looking at this person and he says, listen, do everything you can to get saved. You need to believe that Jesus, I, he's saying that I'm the son of God. You need to believe, church, listen, and those that we're ministering to, that Jesus is the son of God, that he lived a perfect life, he died our death, and he rose again. That's the gospel. And Jesus is letting him know, here I am in your midst. Yeah, you've eaten with me. You've drank with me, but you've rejected me. And what he's saying to the Jewish nation, yeah, you've done your traditions. Yeah, you have tried to follow the law. You've come to Jerusalem three times a year. You've given your sacrifices, but I'm the fulfillment of the law. And you think you're striving, getting into heaven, not realizing that you're one step further every day you don't believe that I am the way, the truth, and the life. That there's no way to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus said. And Jesus made it very clear to this fellow. Listen, one day you're going to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the prophets, your descendants. You're going to see them in the kingdom of God, but you're going to be thrust out because you were seeking salvation another way. In our day, where all roads lead to heaven, it's not true. There is one road that leads to heaven. And you have to pass through one gate. It's narrow. And the reason it's narrow, because there's only one way. And this narrow gate is the Lord Jesus Christ. And unless you believe in him, you will not be saved. Now, the people of the world will say, you're so narrow-minded. No, I'm not narrow-minded. God is. He gave one way to salvation, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God. And so don't you be ashamed of the simplicity and the power of the gospel. You see, nothing we do is going to get us to heaven except we believe. No other religion is going to get you to heaven except you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, that you're following his way. That's what he's saying to this Jewish person. 
This Jewish person who said, no, I'm going my traditions. Listen to the pride that's within them. Take a look, if you would, at verse 29. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who will be first. Though, excuse me. And indeed, there are, there are last who will be first, and there are first who will be last. Listen to the pride of the Jewish nation. They thought, listen, we're it, man. We're on our way to heaven. We're descendants. And he goes, no, wait a second. Let me tell you something. <coughs> I'm going to bring Gentiles in. I'm going to bring them from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Now, you know, as we're studying the book of Acts, the Jews couldn't believe this. They thought the Gentiles were less than them. This statement of Jesus would have enraged them. But what Jesus was talking about was the age of the church. And there are going to be people from the north, south, east, and west. And the responsibility of the church is to go into the world to bring them in. That's our job. That's our function. That's our role. And here Jesus is making very clear to this Jewish person, your law, your traditions, your customs, they're not going to get you to heaven. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. The Jews are going to reject that message as a nation. The Jews are going to refuse Jesus as a nation. And what Jesus is making it very clear, the Gentiles will accept him. And you think you're first. And you think you're giving it all that you've got. But the truth is, the only way to heaven is through me. Well, on that very day, some Pharisees came saying to him, get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now, you might think that the Pharisees are looking out for them, but they're in cohorts with Herod. They don't want Jesus coming to Jerusalem because they don't want people following him. And so the Pharisees are still plotting to divert Jesus from setting his face towards Jerusalem. And he said to them, go tell that fox. In other words, I know you're in cohorts with him. I know that you're in conversation with him. So just go back to that fox. And he describes him as a fox because foxes, they do all their dirty work when no one's watching. They do all their dirty work when everyone's asleep. And so he calls him a fox and he says, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I'll be perfected. Nevertheless, must I must journey today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish, out perish outside of Jerusalem. Do you remember earlier I said that nothing was going to move Jesus? He was on his way to Jerusalem. He set his face as a flint. And here they come with fear to distract him and dissuade him. Hey, Herod's going to kill you. Well, Jesus is thinking... That's why I'm on my way to Jerusalem, to die. Jesus is saying, I can't be distracted, even though you're my enemy, even though you're in cohorts with, the, with uh, 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 Herod the fox. Because Jesus is thinking in his mind, I'm dying for you. You're my enemy, but I'm on my way. I know I'm going to die. You're not telling me anything new. I'm going to die for you. His heart so realized in verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. God doesn't send anyone to hell. People send themselves. Their lack of willingness to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God who lived the life they couldn't live, died the death for them, and then raised to, from the dead to give us eternal life? Why wouldn't you accept that? Because people are not willing. But look at the heart of Jesus. Hey, I, I'm going to Jerusalem. I love Jerusalem. I know I'm going to die there, and I would do anything. In fact, I will. I'm going to die on a cross. I've longed to gather you, but you're not willing. And officially, Jesus basically announces the rejection of the nation. He says, see, verse 34, your house is left to you desolate, and assuredly I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus accepts their rejection. 
And he says to them, you're not going to see me until you, you hear, blessed is he comes in the name of the Lord. Now, there's a partial fulfillment of this when the Pharisees saw him come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And the people were shouting Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisees said, you need to silence them. And Jesus said, if I do, the rocks are going to cry out. So what do you choose, an earthquake or their praise? But there's another fulfillment. It's when Jesus will return. And right before the day the door is shut, he will come a second time. He will deliver the nation of Israel from a physical war, and they'll have an opportunity to look upon the one that they pierced. And the Bible says in the book of Zechariah, there'll be a national revival. Once rejecting Christ, they will look on the one whom they pierced, and they will accept. Gang, it's evident to see from the word of God that Jesus is all about salvation. In fact, let's go back to the original of what he told this man. Strive. Well, if he's asking this unbelieving person to do everything they can to get saved, he must know the misery of the, neepy, the, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth that separated from him. If I know that someone is going to drown, I'm going to do everything I can to rescue them. That's our Savior, and that should be our heart. We're going to break up into our life groups, and if you don't have a life group, this is an opportunity for you to click that Connect tab and join in a life group. Now, I'm looking forward to getting back into our auditorium on Wednesday nights, um, and we're going to have a potluck dinner and be back in here at the end of the summer, the beginning of September. Uh, but in the meantime, we are as well uh, on Zoom right now, and you can go into your Zoom room or click that Connect tab where you can join the Zoom room. And I want to encourage you to have this spiritual conversation about the Bible study to really solidify the truths of Luke 13 in your heart. Now, I want to let you know, in September, we'll still be having a live stream, so you can stay in that Zoom room, or you can be here with us physically and go into your life group when we break up. So God bless you guys. Thanks for joining us. Let me pray for you before we separate. Lord, thank you for those that listen to the word today. And I pray that as we study your word, you'll speak to our hearts. Our lives will be changed forever. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. See you next week.